Hi, I'm Peter Mesaros, and my goal is to provide you with independent investment education that is full with experience to help you instead of the financial industry. I want you to thrive instead of your broker. This is my second interview with Rick, and this is the third part of it, where Rick shares how he invests in this decade and tells us how the precious metals are manipulated and why. You can find the first part on my channel as well, in that you can learn about the Fed and where to invest now, what the Fed is doing, and Rick's best tips to invest now. And the second part was a brief lecture about how to value mining companies. It is very important. I urge you to watch these as well. Uh, I have a, yeah, it's a larger, uh, longer question, uh, but we have very interesting times, uh, sovereign debt bubbles, end of fiat, uh, fiat currency cycle, uh, China has rising power, you know, governments devaluing, devaluing currencies. Um, so it's, it's part of how, how should we navigate in this environment, but also I, I could ask it in another form that you have a family office as well. And, and probably you are looking to preserve your purchasing power in, in longer term, 5, 10, 15 years, right? So how, how do you invest? Uh, with what, what principles do you have to invest for the, for the future? <laughs> I give you three hours. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, that sort of changes. Uh, I'm in a, a wonderful position where I've worked very hard. I've, I've saved slavishly. Uh, I've been lucky and my needs are few. So I, I need to say that my circumstance might be different than some of your listeners. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for it. <clears throat> yeah. um, I maintain very high liquidity, mm -hmm. despite the fact that uh, cash deteriorates in terms of purchasing power. The idea that I uh, would own cash, which I do in term deposits, yielding 60 basis points in a currency that's depreciating by 860 basis points means that I'm losing 8% a year in purchasing power. But I regard that as an option payment. Uh, I've been through several liquidity crises in my life, and having cash when others don't gives you both the tools and the courage to take advantage of the circumstances rather than being taken advantage of. So I maintain high cash balances. I personally consider bullion to be cash, uh, albeit good cash. Uh, that means that in the right set of circumstances, I would sell my bullion, even if it was selling for less, if greater opportunities arose. There are people who, if they paid $1,800 for gold, will not sell it for $1,500. Even if using that liquidity, they could buy an asset that had a higher probability of return in the future. I'm not one of those people. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, my precious metals are both insurance uh, and importantly, yeah. liquidity. Um, I am at this stage in my life uh, increasingly attracted to being a lender uh, rather than being a shareholder. Uh, I know that the worst piece of debt on any individual balance sheet is, the, is better than the best piece of equity. <laughs> so the consequence of that is, particularly in private transactions, when I have the ability, I would prefer to be senior secured uh, with some sort of warrant package, some sort of synthetic equity of the upside, but with my downside uh, covered. Private placements, yeah. Although I don't like, <clears throat> pardon me, although I don't need the income. I like the income. <laughs> uh, I have done a reasonably good job in the last three or four years de-emphasizing speculation and buying the best of the best. Uh, for the last three or four years, <clears throat> the relative valuations of high quality companies have been lower than the valuations of lower quality companies, really for the first time in my career. Uh, Small capitalization companies and micro capitalization companies used to have such inefficient capital markets that they were substantially cheaper than higher quality companies. But we've existed in a narrative market for 15 years to the extent that for the last five or six years in the resource space, the juniors, the penny dreadfuls, uh, have been overpriced relative to the higher quality companies. That's changing now and rapidly. Uh, and so I'm looking at a situation 
where while the whole rest of the world looks to de-risk their exposure, I'm looking to increase risk. Uh, I'm looking at private placement equity transactions where equity is unavailable to issuers from the sources that came to dominate those markets in the last five or six years, where I see the terms beginning to favor the check writer uh, as opposed to, to the issuer. So for myself, when the world goes risk off, I try to go risk on. And I think the world is really truly going risk off right now. So I think it's increasing opportunity for me to exercise that old speculative itch, which has never really gone away. I was just suppressing it. Liquidity is king. And beside of this sector, uh, you also buy um, land, right? Uh, farmland, uh, uh, for example. Not, I, I have been over time an aggressive buyer of farmland and timberland. Uh, the right now, I can't find opportunities in high quality U.S. farmland that attracts me. Uh, three years ago, it was, God, it was paradise, but that's changed. Uh, I recently completed the sale of a, a piece of high quality timberland. Um, and while I hope to be able to return to those sectors, uh, right now, so, the pricing is taking place at levels that I don't understand. Traditionally, too, uh, I've been a water rights investor, uh, but the supply of privately held water rights in areas that I thought were attractive is gone. It, yeah. It's just completely gone. Where I would see uh, a transaction every month uh, and where three or four transactions a year were attractive to me, I see a transaction every 18 months now. Okay, okay, but now I understand more of what you do. Uh, I, sh I should say one other thing. In addition to resources, okay. I invest in conventional financial services businesses, banks, insurance companies, things like that. I, I do it because I, I understand them. I've been involved in working for them, uh, competing against them and building them for 40 or 50 years. Uh, the very, very, very best business in the world is a well-run bank uh, being a used money salesman. It's such a good business that the challenge is not to screw it up. Uh, most people can't help uh, because of greed, but to screw it up. Uh, which is to say they get over leveraged. They take on <clears throat> uh, time swaps, which is to say they incur long-term liabilities that are funded uh, with uh, short-term instruments. They get involved in a time and interest rate mismatch, or they take too much credit risk. Uh, you don't need to do any of those things. The yield curve in the United States is such that the deposit rate uh, on short-term deposits is 60 basis points. And even if you only reinvest the money in short-term treasuries, you get 200 basis points. If you're getting 140 basis point spread uh, and you have a reasonable equity cushion, which is to say 10%, uh, you are generating a, a net interest spread uh, of 100 basis points. If you're generating a net interest spread of 100 basis points uh, utilizing <clears throat> pardon me, uh, nine or 10 to one leverage, your return on capital employed uh, is insane. Yeah. And the levels so, yeah. of risk that you're exposed to, which is to say no mismatch between uh, duration uh, and locking in, uh, locking in your rates on both sides of the transaction, all you have to do is uh, manage your costs uh, and not get greedy. Yeah. Uh, this is a wonderful time uh, to be involved in several aspects of conventional financial services. Thank you for bringing that up. I have two more questions, if I may. Uh, I, I, I saw that you retired, and when I got the, your email about that, okay, you will retire, you will only do this and this and this and this and this and this. <laughs> So this is uh, his uh, idea about retirement. And of course you will make a bank when you retire. Yes. Yes. So um, uh, I have a question for, for concerning this bank um, uh, or two. Will you not lose uh, freedom of speech when you will own this bank? Well, I won't own the bank. Um, okay, okay, okay. Uh, when, I, I guess I should say if, 
but I think it's when we okay. receive our charter, which is to say when the OCC and the FDIC uh, allow us to open for business. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, I sincerely hope that we never become public. Mm -hmm. The last time we did this with Everbank, mm -hmm. we grew so fast that we had to be public. Uh, mm -hmm. So ironically, I'm hoping for slower growth and I'm hoping that we <clears> stay <throat> private. Uh, I, I'm hoping too, to be uh, less than a 10% shareholder, only marginally less, 9.9. .9. Uh, and I'm hoping yep. that after we receive our charter, that it won't be necessary for me to be on the board of the bank. And so in other words, I won't be regarded yep. by anybody, including the FDIC and the OCC yep. as a spokesperson for the bank. I understand, very good. And, uh... And not from the start, but possibly later. Uh, do you have a plan, plan at least? Uh, uh, will there be a solution where you can accept, for example, my gold holding Europe as a deposit? Uh, absolutely. Oh. Uh, de depending on where you would hold it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, be yeah, to begin course. with, um, the gold holdings that we lend against, as an example, uh, will need to be at Loomis or Brinks. They will need to be at depositories that are controlled by public companies so yeah. that we can understand the balance sheet and the income statement and the security of the depository. Uh, that gold would remain in your name, but if we lent against it, it would have to be in segregated storage where we had a lockbox arrangement with Loomis or Brinks. Uh, this is gonna be an important part uh, of the activity of the bank. Yeah. We know the community that owns bullion. Uh, we know how to talk to them. We know how to access them because we're part of that community. Uh, and the idea that somebody owns a million dollars worth of gold, but has a need for half a million dollars in liquidity uh, and can't borrow against that gold is one of the dumbest market situations I've ever seen in my life. And I uh, hope to address that to the benefit of all concerned. Thank you. Uh, and final question. Um, you mentioned earlier that there was a time when the precious metals were manipulated upwards mm -hmm. instead of down, like today. Um, right. What, 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 because I, I, I never grew up in this time. So what is it like and why should this time come back again? My belief, and this will get me a lot of hate mail, uh, but my belief is, is that there hasn't been any very long-term, multi-decade manipulation in the price of gold or silver. Uh, my belief is that the strength in the U.S. dollar in the face of declining interest rates from 1982 to 2022 manipulated the price of gold and silver down all by itself, uh, and nobody needed to give it an assist. But all financial assets, all markets are manipulated by trading desks and syndicates in the short term. If you look at the fines leveled against Deutsche Bank, J.P. Morgan Chase, HSBC, it's pretty clear that markets as large as the U.S. Treasury and the LIBOR market are manipulated. Indeed, yeah. So a market that's as small as the silver market, as an example, is a sitting duck. Hmm. How is this done? Well, traditionally, one of two ways. Spoofing, mm -hmm. which is to say uh, putting up a bunch of false bids or false asks in the market in an attempt to spook other players and take the price either up or down, depending on one's position. Very, very, very common technique. Uh, the second is what's called laddering. Uh, in that circumstance, if you have a market where uh, uh, the trading volumes in the futures market are substantially larger than the physical amount of assets mm -hmm. uh, that is deposited for settlements of the trade, it's very, very, very easy to manipulate the long-term market. Let's look at the silver market as an example, where daily trading volumes in the paper market are frequently daily, by the way, mm -hmm. 100 times the value of the collateral for the trades. In a circumstance like that, a syndicate might go into the longer term future market, the 18 month market, the two year market, the 30 month market would be an example, uh, establish short positions uh, on a highly leveraged basis, uh, you know, sort of margin that was assumed as sort of a, a, a 10 to one leverage ratio. Then 
borrow 50 or 60 million dollars worth of physical silver in the overnight market collateralized sell that physical silver into a thin market some mm -hmm. point in time at night when there weren't very many participants seeking to take the silver market down by three or four or five percent the action there could take the outside futures market down by five or six percent and if the futures market, if you use $60 million, as an example, to depress the whole <clears throat> futures ladder in silver by 5 or 6%, and you had a billion dollar short position while risking $100 million in capital, uh, it would be relatively easy for you, albeit with some risk, to generate a 50 or $60 million return on the short-term deployment of 150 or $160 million in capital. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 1970s, when the primary direction of precious metals was up, mm -hmm. the exact same trade took place in reverse. Uh, people would get very, very, very long in the futures market, uh, and then they would execute overnight buy transactions during a period of time when the market was thinnest so that they could take the gold price up by 20 or $30 uh, and uh, use that distortion in the futures market to settle highly leveraged long trades. Yeah, okay. So, uh, and, and what we see is that these big players, they buy the physical, and uh, we should do it probably as well, because these times could come back, right? Well, the, the big players that are uh, manipulating the market seldom buy it. They borrow it. They put up cash collateral. Uh, they're participation with the physical is simply a way to manipulate uh, the latter. Mm -hmm. There are certainly other big investors who aren't involved in manipulation, who are simply buying physical precious metals because they believe uh, in its traditional role as insurance. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, I, I think uh, <clears throat> our time is up. Uh, so thank you very much again for being here for us. And uh, I enjoyed every minute. Uh, and I hope uh, I can see you in about a month uh, or more. Uh, uh, I, I look forward to that. In the interim, uh, any of your listeners who want to continue to engage in a conversation with me are invited to go to my website, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. If you care what I think about resource stocks, in particular your resource stocks, all you have to do is list them there and I will rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. Uh, if you care, by the way, about what private placements I invest in, in the question and comment section, write placements. If you care about my bank, if you weren't happy with your existing banking relationships and hope that I could improve them, in the question and comment section, write bank. Uh, if you want information about my conference, in the question and comment section, write either conference or Boca, and we will send it to you. Yeah, I hope they will do, because it's really, really good. Yeah, I okay, will. thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you for watching part three. Please don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Share this video with others. It is really important, and I, I think it's a very good value. If you visit Rick's Symposium, please find the links in the description below. See you. Have a nice day.